Okay. Here we go. Okay. Good night, or everybody. Um, good to see everybody in the room tonight. Uh, before we get started, though, I want to thank Cindy Thompson for providing CART this evening. Thank you very much. Cindy is always uh, right on time, and she's an excellent CART provider, so we really appreciate her being here tonight. Um, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Douglas Beck. He, uh, I know you can read the entire bio on our website, but I just wanted to mention that he is writing an article for the January-February issue of Hearing Loss Magazine, and I'm excited about that because his, uh, he's a prolific writer. He's an excellent writer on topics related to hearing loss and audiology. So we're very excited about that. And um, I'm happy to report that he has submitted a paper for um, HLA 2017 convention in Salt Lake City. So keeping my fingers crossed that that is accepted and uh, that he'll be presenting. Um, I know uh, this topic of tinnitus is one we get questions about all the time, and uh, it's, a, it's a popular topic. I know so many people suffer from it. So, Dr. Beck, welcome. Thank you again for presenting tonight, and I'll let you get started. Thank you, Nancy. Um, it's a uh, pleasure to be here, even though I can't see any of you. It's uh, it's just like sitting here and speaking to my computer, but I guess that's okay. Um, the overriding thought that I want to give you about tinnitus is that no two people perceive tinnitus the same way. Um, there are many different types of tinnitus, many manifestations, and uh, the fact that two people may have tinnitus and may describe it very similar doesn't mean it's the same because our perception of sound is a unique individual experience. So let's start with the first slide. And my, my, my plan is to go uh, just under an hour, probably about 50 minutes or so, and then we'll take questions from you guys. And if the questions run into overtime, that's fine. Uh, I've got a plane to catch early in the morning, but I'm good. So we can, uh, we can stay an extra couple of minutes if need be. In general, uh, when we talk about tinnitus, there are two types. And it's very important to understand that you can't tell the difference unless you're professionally evaluated. Now, the reason I say that is many times people will present, they'll come into an office and they'll complain about ringing in the, in the ears. And indeed, if it has a physical origin, it could be that their ear is full of wax, it could be a broken eardrum. It could be the three little bones, the malleus, incus, and stapes have become damaged. Lots of reasons that people can have tinnitus that are physical, and that's called objective. Now, the good news with objective tinnitus is that we can fix it. If you see an audiologist or a hearing aid dispenser, and they think your tinnitus is objective, that means it has a physical source. They'll probably refer you to an ear, nose, and throat doctor and he or she will examine you and perhaps offer medicine or surgery or whatever is appropriate at that moment. Unfortunately, only about 3% of all tinnitus is objective. So that means 97% is subjective. Now, subjective tinnitus has a couple of good and bad things about it as well. Um, the good news is subjective tinnitus is unlikely to cause uh, any physical damage. And the good news is that up to about 90% of the time, and you know, I, I've shown the data on this to many audiences, but, uh, and, and I don't have the time to, to share it with you, but I'll give you the summary. And the summary is that probably 90% of the time, people who have tinnitus can be effectively managed. And that's, that's what this slide is saying, right? 90% of the time we can manage it. And what I mean effectively managing it, I'm talking about managing it so you may perceive it, you may not, but it will bother you considerably less. That's the goal. If the goal were to be to cure tinnitus, it would be unlikely we could do that. It's not likely we can cure tinnitus. It's very likely we can help manage tinnitus. So what is tinnitus? Well, this is a definition I put together in 2012 uh, for the British Academy of Audiology. I was doing a presentation uh, for that group on tinnitus. And this is a compilation. I didn't create any of these words. I just assembled them from many of my colleagues and other authors who write on tinnitus. So two things. 
It's a phantom sound or noise perceived in the ears, most often described as a buzzing, ringing, crickets, whistling, humming, static, high pitched tone, any of those things that occur in the absence of a known external stimulus. So that known external stimulus, that would be objective tinnitus. If you have tinnitus being caused by a physical sign or symptom, it would be objective. Most of it isn't, it's subjective. And part two of the definition is a failure to habituate. And what I mean by that, most of you who are listening and reading uh, the closed caption or the card right now, right now you're not aware of your socks, right up until I said socks, at which point you became aware of your socks, um, because you habituated to them. Um, and, and it's a very common human uh, psychological adaptation. We habituate rapidly to different stimuli, whether it's sound, whether it's visual stimuli, whether it's a smell. You know, if you smell something that's really foul, after a little while, you smell it less intensely because you start to habituate to it. Um, so the thing with tinnitus is it's a phantom sound generally, 90%, 97% of the time, and one cannot easily adapt to it or habituate to it. Now, the people who can habituate to it uh, don't complain about it. It doesn't mean they don't have it, but it doesn't cause them distress. So the numbers look like this. There's about 30, let's say 330 million people in the United States. Of those, perhaps 33 to 35 million perceive tinnitus. Of those, about 10% or 3 million, maybe 3.5 million, would say that it's bothersome. So it's a relatively small amount of people, but uh, you know, perhaps 1% of the population, maybe a little more, perceive of tinnitus so badly that they might seek help or seek a solution to it. Um, so relatively small uh, amount of people, unless you're one of them, in which case it, it has tremendous influence on your life. The three main things that it does when people perceive tinnitus and they can't habituate to it, it uh, causes difficulty in hearing, it causes difficulty in concentration, and it causes difficulty in sleep patterns. So those are the, the three areas we look at. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, if two people have the exact, they describe it the same, uh, could be totally different. This is a study from uh, Dr. Edgermont, uh, published this one in 2012, and he was pointing out that if you give uh, a series of people with normal hearing and you just give them a pure tone, like a 4,000 hertz tone, about 34% of those people will describe it as a tone. So they were correct, about one out of three people get it correct. 26% listening to a tone describe it as a hissing sound. 18% say it's a roaring sound, and 22% might say it's whistling, squeaking, or whatever. And that's my point. The, the fact that somebody says, yeah, it's a ringing, or yeah, it sounds like static, or I'm, I'm sure that's their perception, and that's what it sounds like to them, but to each person, those words have different meanings. So uh, good, good to know. It doesn't change very much, but it does tell us that the fact that somebody's described it as a whistle, or a tone, or a roaring sound, or a hiss, doesn't necessarily mean that I would describe it that way. So we, we covered the numbers already. Uh, it's about 30. Some of my publications I've written up to 50 million people. Uh, you see that I published that one in uh, 2011. Uh, the Journal of the American Academy of Audiology says 50 million. But, you know, I'm, I'm thinking now it's probably closer to 30 to 35 million. I, I could go through the reasons and the rationale, but it, it's not that important. So about 10% of the population will admit that yes, they have a ringing sound of some sort in their ears, and about 10, maybe 20% of those, it's clinically significant. That is, it bothers them enough that they would seek a solution. Now, many people think that tinnitus is tied to hearing loss. That is, if you have hearing loss, you're likely to have tinnitus, and, um, and, and that's true that there's a greater likelihood, but it's only about 80%. Now, this is a weird number. It's called the 80-80 rule. And again, it's something I came up with in 2012. If you Google this, put in to Google, not now, not during the class, but after the class, go to Google, put in tinnitus, comma, 80, 80 rule, and you'll see this come up. 80% of all patients with sensory neural hearing loss, if you ask them, they'll say, yes, they have a ringing sound in their ears or a whistling or a buzzing or something. And 80% of all the people who have tinnitus have sensory neural hearing loss, the most common type of hearing loss. But it's certainly not a one-to-one -one correlation. And if we think about 35 million people in the United States, let's say 35 million have tinnitus, 80% of that would be 7 million people. So 7 million people have tinnitus without hearing loss. 
And that's important because many times you'll hear a physician or an audiologist or a hearing aid dispenser say, well, the reason you have tinnitus is because you have hearing loss. The problem with that is I've got 7 million people in America who have tinnitus without hearing loss. So, so that doesn't ring true to me. Might be true a little bit some of the time for some people, but certainly not a universal truth. Another one that comes up, people will say, well, you have tinnitus because your brain is filling in the missing sounds, you know, because of your hearing loss. Um, again, I got 7 million people who don't have any missing sounds but have tinnitus. So I, I, it may be true a little bit, some people, some of the time, certainly not a universal truth. Um, to me, and let's see, there's about 40 people in this room, and, and hopefully we'll get a little bit of time at the end to talk about and, and share your perspectives. But most often, tinnitus is a manifestation of stress. Um, and then it, it's interesting because hearing loss absolutely matters. The auditory system matters. The emotional, psychological status of the patient matters. The overall health of the patient matters. The drugs they're on matter. All these things matter. But there's a study out of um, it was Sweden or Norway. I want to say Sweden. Let me see if I gave you that study. Yeah, here it is. This is a study that was kind of clever, and uh, it came out in 2011, and it's in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. The journal is called Ear and Hearing. It's a very well-known, highly respected journal in America, and it's peer-reviewed. And they had 20,100 people chosen at random to receive a questionnaire. Now, what you should know, in Sweden, which is, I'm pretty sure where it was done, um, they have national health. So these people didn't pay to come in and see the physician or the audiologist or, or the dispenser. They, um, you know, they, their care is free. I'm going to try and fix it. Oh, I should have done that 10 minutes ago, right? That's a better picture. Um, so 20,000 people get a questionnaire. Of those, 12,166 return their questionnaire. Now, if you've ever done any surveying at all, that's an unbelievably high return rate. 61% of people returning a questionnaire is unbelievable, particularly when you have 12,000 of them. The typical response rate, if you send out a questionnaire in America, is going to be between 1 and 3%. If, if you've done a phenomenal job and you've made it very easy and people are really interested in your topic, you might get 5%. So 61%, unbelievably high return rate. Well, the conclusion of the study was that stress was the difference between mild and significant tinnitus. That is, if you have mild tinnitus, just a little bit, you notice it now and then, but you're under stress, that stress becomes significant. That stress manifest your tinnitus as significant. So those seem to be the two things, you know, that if you have a little bit of tinnitus to begin with, you're one of those 35 million, but now you're under stress, now it's significant. And now you start to perceive it more and worry about it more. And it's not just ears. You know, we said the ADA rule says 80% of tinnitus likely seems to be associated with hearing loss. But it could it could come from anywhere. It could come from visual issues. It could come from somatosensory issues. It could come from tactile issues. It could come from anywhere in your brain, anywhere in your body. I know that sounds a little bizarre, but if you look into the research literature, there's many, many people who've made this claim. And it's the idea of something called synesthesia. Now, synesthesia is when we perceive one sensory system, like vision or hearing, for another. Now, that may seem a little bizarre, but if you Google that, you'll find out that one out of about every 200 people is synesthetic. So they might get a visual stimuli or a tactile stimuli, and they perceive it auditorily. So I, because of time, I'm going to leave it there. But, but I think you get the idea. It's not just coming from ears. Uh, it could be a lot of different systems that contribute to the perception of tinnitus. Because what we experience is not just a product of raw sensory input, like audition or vision or smell or taste or tactile. But what we experience reflects the combined influence of all your sensory systems working together and the internal state of the observer. Now, this is a, a, a note I took from uh, Dr. John Sorensis at uh, University of California, San Diego. He's a clinical psychologist. But you get the idea. So it's what you perceive, and it's dependent on the internal state of the observer, but it's also how it makes you feel and what you think about it. These things are very important. This is um, a dear friend of mine, Agi Moeller. Uh, Dr. Moeller uh, and I met probably 35 years ago. And he has one of the first PhDs ever in the world from, uh, I believe, it was Linkping University in Sweden in auditory uh, neurophysiology back in the 60s. And he's a, um, a uh, professor emeritus, I believe, at the uh, University of Texas, Dallas. 
Dr. Moeller's book in 2011 is actually the scientific reference book on tinnitus. And uh, I was interviewing him for the American Academy of Audiology in 2011, and that's where this quote com com comes from. Now, you can find this if you go to uh, the American Academy of Audiology website, which is just audiology.org. You see that on the bottom of your screen. And put in Avi Moeller, you'll pull up the interview. But he said this, a very important uh, issue. Tinnitus is not one thing, it's many things. When people say they want to cure tinnitus, it's very much like saying you want to cure cancer or cure pain. The thing is that cancer, pain, and tinnitus, they're not a single thing. And so it's a lot more difficult than you might realize. Tinnitus has many forms, many shapes, sizes, manifestations, and perceptions. And it may very well be different in every person who perceives it. So curing it with the same treatment is noble, and it's an honorable goal, but it's unlikely. Um, that's usually where I put in this little thought. Uh, in hearing loss, and I'm an audiologist, my doctorate's in, in audiology. In hearing loss, in tinnitus, there are no go-to solutions. In other words, given this hearing loss, we do that. That's, that's not the best way to think of things. What you have to say is if I have this hearing loss, I'm going to run these tests so I can figure out the basis of the hearing loss, but also how it impacts the person. And then I'm going to talk to the person and see what problems it presents for them and what solutions make sense for them. So it's not that we can treat everybody the same way. It depends on who the individual is and how much difficulty they're having as a result of their hearing loss or their tinnitus. So we'll move on. Um, the point I made early on is we can't cure tinnitus, but we can successfully manage it because there are two components, the sound you perceive and how it affects you. So two people could perceive the exact same sound. One person, it hardly bothers at all, and the other person, it drives to distraction, the exact same sound. So we can measure it. You know, as audiologists, as otolaryngologists, as hearing aid dispensers, we can try to match the pitch and the loudness of the tinnitus, and that, that's an important thing to do sometimes. Uh, more importantly is we do something called the THI, the Tinnitus Handicap Inventory. And that tells us quite a bit about how you're perceiving it. Because what we want to do once we know it's subjective and it's not going to cause physical damage is we want to help you manage it. So we need to get a good quanti uh, quantifiable analysis, which we can do. There's two or three tools that are very good. But my favorite is the THI, the Tinnitus Handicap Inventory. It's about 25 questions that I would ask you, you would answer, and then I would give you a score. And that tells me how uh, disabling or how severe or how significant that tinnitus is to you. And that's then what I want to manage. I'm hoping that if I manage you successfully, a couple of months later, we can do the THI again, and you'll have a much lesser score, a much lower score. We talked about this earlier. This is from uh, Rich Tyler. He's a professor at uh, University of Iowa. And in Rich's work, he said early on, this is in 2011, uh, the same thing I told you earlier, that when you have tinnitus that's very significant, it's going to impact your hearing, about 39% of patients, concentration, about 26% of patients with tinnitus say it's so bad they can't concentrate well, and it's going to interfere with sleep in about one of five patients. But in 2014, Dr. Tyler added to this, very, very clever, he said, but you know what? It impacts your thoughts and emotions 100% of the time. So the tinnitus patient really cannot adapt to it. And simply saying something like, oh, everybody has tinnitus, you have to get used to it, that doesn't really help anybody with tinnitus. And, and it's kind of an inappropriate thing to say, because if they could get used to it, they wouldn't have come to see you. So how do you know which treatment for which patient? Because quite frankly, there's hundreds of treatments out there. And we try to approach things scientifically. You know, if, this is the short list, of course. <coughs> Pardon me. We could talk about all these different treatments, and perhaps if you want to ask questions about them in particular at the end of the lecture, I'll go into them in detail. But the number one treatment of all time for tinnitus is hearing aids. Uh, hearing aids fit excellence, uh, with, with excellence by a professional will control tinnitus the vast majority of the time. It will make it much more manageable because of the 80-80 rule. So think about this. 80% of the people with tinnitus have hearing loss. Well, people with hearing loss are stressed because they don't communicate easily. They have to ask for repeats. They can't remember what's being said. They get confused easily in background noise because their hearing isn't 
very good. And so the tinnitus that they perceive starts to manifest as a greater and greater and greater problem because it's interrupting all these other things. So if you fit somebody with excellent hearing aids, um, you tend to de-stress them because now they can communicate much more readily. I'll give you just a sentence on each of these. So biofeedback eh, helps a couple of people here and there, not a big solution. Hypnosis, not really. Um, there are some of you in the audience who probably have stopped smoking or lost weight with hypnosis. That's fantastic. I don't say anything negative about that, but I'll tell you that what the scientific literature says is you really wanted to do that, and that, that helped get you over the edge. So it's useful there. That's fine. Is it a big cure of all the studies done with hypnosis and tinnitus? No, not really. It hasn't panned out that well. Counseling, yes. Um, in particular, cognitive behavioral therapy. So the two things that I uh, almost always recommend is people with tinnitus, after we've ruled out anything medical, uh, you know, surgical or medically uh, controllable, then uh, the two things are hearing aids and counseling. Because uh, there are some people who have horrible tinnitus that I'm not going to put a hearing aid on for some reason, but they would probably do very well with cognitive behavioral therapy. That type of therapy, retraining the brain how to perceive sound is very, very effective. In fact, probably uh, it is the single most effective therapy of all time for the tinnitus patient. And what it does is it restructures, reconceptualizes how the patient perceives and reacts to their tinnitus. Again, we're not going to eliminate the tinnitus, but for the patient who's really bothered by it, if we can give them control over it, that's a magical thing. Habituation, okay. Uh, tinnitus retraining therapy, that's, that's a popular one. Um, and, and that comes from my colleague, Powell Jasterboff, who's brilliant, and I've known Powell 30 years. Um, I am not a huge fan. I think when he created it a long time ago, about uh, 25, 30 years ago, it was the single most clever, well-thought-through, helpful model. But now if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick a different one, something called PTM, Progressive Tinnitus Management. And that's a series... Uh, it, it's got five levels. It's from Dr. James Henry out in Oregon. Progressive tinnitus management is what we use for veterans and uh, the, the young men who come back from uh, battlefields who have horrible hearing loss and tinnitus. They get progressive tinnitus management, and it's the most proven in, in the scientific literature. It's the most proven approach to, maintain, to managing tinnitus. So as an audiologist, if I saw you, I'd probably, uh, if you have hearing loss, I'll certainly go ahead and proceed with fit hearing aids to see if that helps out, and probably will. If it doesn't, I'll pay more attention to something formal, like progressive tinnitus management, and make sure that we work through all of those steps. And the final step in that happens to be cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's inclusive of all these other things. So those of you who are looking for a protocol, looking for an answer, you just want one thing to look up on Google, PTM, progressive tinnitus management, really good. Electrical stimulation doesn't work. Um, remember Volta, 50,000 volts in his ears, and then he you know, fell over backwards, and he's on his back for about six months. And not a good therapy, not a good way to go. Tinnitus masters. Well, if a patient says to me, you know, gee, I'm only bothered when I'm about to go to sleep. My tinnitus keeps me up at night. It's driving me crazy. Yeah, if I had something, a, a different sound, that would be great. Well, then get a tinnitus master. Go to Amazon. Uh, go to Google, put in tinnitus maskers, bedside tinnitus maskers, and you can get these for $20, $30, $40 that are infinitely variable, and, uh, and they're great, and, and so that's fine. Um, but when we talk about hearing aids, we're talking about walking around with something in your day-to-day -day existence, something comfortable, something flexible, something um, that, you know, a tinnitus masker is usually quite large, the size of a CD player or something, and, and so you're probably not going to want to walk around with that on your shoulder, but a uh, set of hearing aids, most who are well-fitted, um, people don't really notice them anymore because they've become remarkably small. Uh, sound generators, yes, so depending on what the sound generator is. Different types of sounds, you know, fractal tones, they sound like wind chimes. They help relax some people sometimes. Pink noise is like a white noise is more like a it's hard to do those. And um, there's no evidence that any one of those brown noise, red noise, that any one of those is any better than any other. They all work on some people some of the time. And, um, and that's terrific. Support groups are good um, <clears throat> if they're led by a professional who's actually well versed in tinnitus. The reason I don't like support groups, in, uh, unless they have a strong leader who's very knowledgeable, is it tends to be people 
uh, complaining to each other about how bad their life is and how miserable their tinnitus is or their Meniere's disease or their acoustic neuron. And I get that. You know, it is miserable. Absolutely. But a bunch of people sitting around talking to each other about how bad it is, I don't see how that's beneficial unless it's led by somebody who actually knows a lot about it and can tell you management strategies and how to benefit from uh, what he or she has learned. So self-help groups, same sort of thing. Drug therapy, this comes up a lot. There are no drugs that work directly on tinnitus. Now, if you have a very wise physician and a very good relationship with your physician, he or she may recommend particular drugs like perhaps Valium or a derivative of that because it helps de-stress the patient. So it's not acting directly on the tinnitus, but it helps to make your life a little bit less stressful. And then you might sleep better and be less distracted, and it might be a part of your cognitive behavioral therapy, perhaps, because it'll, it gives you a bridge between learning strategies and knowing strategies. So drug therapy doesn't work directly on tinnitus, but does help certain tinnitus patients some of the time. Stress management, well, of course, because as I told you, I believe the number one contributing factor to uh, tinnitus is going to be stress. Uh, chiropractic, well, there's absolutely no studies in the peer-reviewed literature showing that chiropractic has ever had a direct impact on hearing loss or um, tinnitus. Um, however, much like pharmacology, if the chiropractor de-stresses you uh, because you feel better, uh, like a massage therapy session might do, well, if it de-stresses you and you're better able to cope with your tinnitus, but that, that's a good thing. I wouldn't argue against it but it's not a direct cause and effect between that treatment and the problem, okay? Um, so let's go on to the next one. So which treatment? How do you know which one? You know, we've got millions of people with tinnitus. How do you know which treatment to pick? Well, I'm going to pick the one that's most likely to work most of the time for most of the patients. That's going to be hearing aids. Now, the hearing aids that are available in 2016 have nothing whatsoever to do with the hearing aids that were available 10 years ago or even five years ago. Some patients will say, oh, they tried hearing aids, it didn't work. I would urge them to try it again. The technology has skyrocketed. Uh, we have hearing aids, my company in particular, and I, I won't make this a commercial thing, but very, very pleasant sounds, like you hear the ocean. Now, some other companies did that earlier, where they had the ocean going out here and coming in here, so the patients would become schizo. No, I didn't say that out loud, did I? But, yeah, so what we do, you know, we have the hearing aids talk to each other in real time. So it sounds like the ocean going out and the ocean coming back in. So you have pleasant sounds to listen to. And that, that helps a lot because we're trying to give you a masking sound, an alternative sound to listen to. But we're also trying to give you a sound that's pleasant so it might de-stress you. Now, there's a study out of England, and I've shared this with many of my colleagues. You can find this or send me a note and I'll, I'll send you a link to it where the National Institute of Health in the United Kingdom said that certainly the go-to solution, I hate that term, but you get the idea, was hearing aids. Some patients, they said, use hearing aids with cognitive behavioral therapy. And that same working group said if those things, if the patient does not have hearing loss, they would still approach it the same way. They'd still go with hearing aids because it's the most proven treatment for tinnitus and cognitive behavioral therapy. So I can't say put hearing aids on people if they don't have hearing loss. But we do know that hearing aids are very effective in masking tinnitus, and they're very effective in de-stressing patients who have hearing loss. Um, so it might be worth a try. Again, I'm not, and, and that's going to vary by who you see and what their state licensure laws are and all these other things, but it's an option. And if, if the patient's not getting relief any other way, uh, I might try it. I, I personally try these sorts of things, and generally they work out well as long as they have a good scientific foundation. Let me show you some of the uh, hearing aid uh, success stories. This comes from the Hearing Review in 2008, so it's already about eight years old. But this is um, Sergey Kochkin and Rich Tyler. Again, uh, Dr. Kochkin is a uh, PhD uh, psychologist. Uh, he's not in our industry anymore, but he, he did brilliant work for us for 25 years. Richard Tyler is a professor at Iowa, so neither of them works for a hearing aid company. And in fact, what they said is 60% of the patients report some relief of their tinnitus with just hearing aids, but 22% actually report major relief with just hearing aids. So you add those two together, you get about 82% find benefit for their tinnitus issue by just wearing hearing aids. Okay. There's another study, a little more recent, 2011. Again, you see Dr. Tyler and uh, Dr. Kutchkin, but also uh, Dr. Bourne, or uh, I believe she's a doctor, I'm not sure. Um, and 
here's what they said. So this is November 2011. Um, and, and you could Google this, by the way. Look at the top line. The prevalence of tinnitus in the USA and the self-reported efficacy of various treatments. So if you Google that and put in November 2011, you'll pull up the study. 28% of hearing aid users, moderate to substantial reduction in tinnitus with just hearing aids. 66% tinnitus relief most or all of the time with just hearing aids. 29% hearing aids alleviated their tinnitus all of the time. So pretty impressive numbers. This is a very recent study. This was 2012. This is on 70 patients. And you see about um, two-thirds male, one-third female, average age 55. Pardon me. 26 patients, tinnitus totally masked with just hearing aids. 28 patients, or 40%, partial, excuse me, partial masking. But about 16 of the 70, no masking. They, they didn't find any benefit with their hearing aids. So these are patients, I wouldn't give up on them at all. I, I, I would totally uh, be working with a counselor, usually a PhD clinical psychologist is my favorite. That's not to say there aren't social workers who do this very well or other types of counselors who do this very well. But my favorite um, would be a PhD clinical psychologist who does, who's very familiar with hearing loss and tinnitus and who does cognitive behavioral therapy. So those 16 on the bottom line there that received no masking benefit from hearing aids, that would be the next step. And, and maybe it would have been an earlier step had I chosen to go with progressive tinnitus management. So you get the idea. Hearing aids reduce the audibility of the tinnitus, that is the perception of the sound of tinnitus, and it improves the patient's reaction to their tinnitus. That was their conclusion. Let's go on to the next one. Um, so one question that comes up a lot is patients ask me and other professionals ask me, do I need to have a masking device in my hearing aid? Um, so in, in addition to making sounds louder, hearing aids can offer pink noise, white noise, fractal noise, ocean sounds, rain sounds, these sorts of things. Well, I think that it's good to have it there. I can tell you that, um, and again, not to get commercial, but just so you know, in our hearing aids, the company I work for, Oticon, when we have tinnitus devices within the hearing aids, there, there's no extra charge for them. They're included in most of the, uh, most of the hearing aids that, that have those solutions. They, they don't charge for that. Now, does it make a big deal of difference? Well, this is a study, again, peer-reviewed, 2015, and this is Dr. Henry. Again, he's the guy who created and, and has written fabulous work on progressive tinnitus management. So he says, he did the study on hearing aids compared to hearing aid, to combination devices. So a combination device is a hearing aid with a masker. So the authors investigated this, and the first thing they found out was there were no previous investigations of this. In other words, nobody had ever compared successful tinnitus management with just plain old excellent hearing aids versus plain old excellent hearing aids that have maskers. So after they did this with their uh, patients, they concluded that hearing aids with sound generators and without sound generators both provided significant benefit to alleviate the effects of tinnitus. However, it didn't matter which one. 87% of all participants reported meaningful reductions in their tinnitus using hearing aids or using hearing aids with uh, maskers. So that's, uh, that's important to know. The most effective hearing aid setting for tinnitus suppression may not be the one that is used for hearing loss. In other words, when a patient comes in and has hearing loss, we, um, we tend to set the hearing aid for their hearing loss, and that makes good sense. Um, but this study by Dr. Shekouad and Sergefeld and Stenier points out that you may need a second program that's dedicated just to the tinnitus perception. And if you set it for the hearing aids, you're going to help a lot of people a lot of the time. But there are certainly going to be many people who need an entirely different set of uh, parameters in their hearing aid to really uh, de-stress them, to really um, minimize their tinnitus perception. Um, this was the study I was talking about earlier from the National Institute of Health Research Biomedical Research Unit. And again, the panelists considered the presence of bothersome tinnitus alone without hearing loss a sufficient criteria for fitting hearing aids. The only reason I put that in there is there certainly are patients who have tinnitus that don't have hearing loss, and they wonder, you know, should they try hearing aids? And this study sort of indicates that, yeah, and this came out in 2015. Now, this is also peer-reviewed at Ear and Hearing, which is an American publication, and uh, it, it gives you 
some um, encouragement that uh, that there are options available with or without hearing loss. And and I haven't seen this come out of anyone in the USA, but coming out of the UK is a pretty strong endorsement. Uh, I mentioned a couple of times about cognitive behavioral therapy, and um, the reason I do that, and, and you can go online and find out more about it, audiologists, otolaryngologists, hearing aid dispensers don't really do this kind of work. This is done by counselors, um, and it's basically a restructuring uh, of how one thinks about their tinnitus. Uh, so behavior modification and cognitive restructuring. Again, it's very easy to Google this and find out about it, so I'm, I'm going to just leave it there. But I know I've said cognitive behavioral therapy a couple of times. Some of you are probably wondering what's that about. And, and it might take, and, and it's going to depend on how severe the tinnitus is and how much hearing loss is involved and, and who the counselor is. But uh, it wouldn't surprise me if it took 10 to 20 one-hour sessions to do this. And, um, and again, it's nothing that I, I don't know of any audiologists uh, who are involved in this at this time, other than to work with a psychologist who does this type of work and refer to that individual. Um, as far as references for it, Dr. Henry, the fellow who uh, came up with progressive tinnitus management, he says, the primary management tool based on peer-reviewed evidence is cognitive behavioral therapy. Dr. Seema, Cognitive behavioral therapy is the most evidence-based treatment option with regard to managing a tinnitus patient. Now, if you want copies of these references, it's quite easy. Um, the paper is in the upper left corner. It's uh, one I wrote with my colleagues, uh, Dr. DePlacido and Dr. Paxton, and it's called Issues in Tinnitus 2014-2015, a Review of Contemporary Findings. So the easiest way to find that one is you would just go to hearingreview.com and put in Beck, comma, tinnitus, and I've written a few papers, and they'll all be pulled up that way. You shouldn't have any problem with that at all. Um, this is, we talked very briefly about tinnitus retraining therapy, and I said it's okay. I, I prefer progressive tinnitus management in 2016, but, um, and this is one of the things that, that made me look a little bit beyond TRT. This is a peer-reviewed paper from the International Journal of Audiology, and uh, these guys looked at tinnitus retraining therapy with sound generators, just a sort of a sound, versus wearing open ear hearing aids. And they measured the patient's tinnitus using the tinnitus uh, handicap inventory, the THI. And the bottom line conclusion was it didn't matter if you used a sound generator or a hearing aid. And this is based on 91 patients. So uh, sound generators are good. Nothing wrong with sound generators. Some people do great with them. But again, this is why I think many of us uh, hearing aid is the go-to therapy because we have a lot more control over the sound you will perceive through a hearing aid. And uh, they actually work very, very similarly. Again, this is peer-reviewed International Journal of Audiology, 2011, 91 patients. And the bottom line here, the specific sound therapy, whether it's a sound generator or a hearing aid, didn't really make much of a difference. They both did pretty well. Uh, PTM, we've used that. Um, term a couple of times. Let me give you a little bit more on that, and you can find this. Uh, this is a government document. So PTM, Progressive Tinnitus Management, offers strong support for therapeutic sound to manage tinnitus. If it doesn't support any particular sound as superior to any other, rather they say the judicious use of sound is helpful. That's the wise use of sound. And, you know, just putting a lot of sound in there is not such a wise thing to do but judicious use of sound, because the goal of intervention with progressive tinnitus management is for the patient to learn how to develop and implement individualized plans to manage their reaction to tinnitus. And these plans involve the use of therapeutic sound, that might be a hearing aid or a masking device or a combination, and uh, coping techniques such as um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. This is a, um, I, I used to get a lot more questions on fractal tones. The fractal tones are fine. I have no issue with them. They're kind of pleasant to listen to. They sound like uh, wind chimes. And this is a study that was published by the Journal of the American Academy of Audiology. That's a peer-reviewed journal. And they basically said at the end, for half the subjects, there were 14 subjects, half of them using fractal tones did show a decrease uh, with regard to annoyance from tinnitus after six months. But the authors of the study were unable to determine and this is a very important point, how much of the relief came from overall hearing aid amplification versus how much of it came from fractal tones. So it could have been that the fractal tones were very impactful, and it could have been that the hearing aids. But the, the point is the patients, half of them did very, very well after six months. And that, that's the take-home message. 
Um, but then the authors added that uh, acoustic treatments for hearing aid, for tinnitus, such as a hearing aid or a masking device, without the multiple benefits derived from counseling will likely not suffice. Indeed, tinnitus management procedures need to be supplemented with appropriate counseling. So it's not like you're just going to put a hearing aid on somebody and walk away and their the problem solved. This is a uh, study from the Cleveland Clinic. This one also is peer reviewed in the Journal of the American Academy of Audiology. And this is based on 56 patients going through one therapy with sound generators, comparing it to something called neuromonics. And neuromonics is very, very clever. It's a, uh, it's a prescribed therapy treatment. It works pretty reasonably well. And in fact, if you look at the THI scores, what these researchers found is that whether you used a sound generator or neuromonics actually didn't make any difference clinically. They both did pretty well. Um, the difference was the cost. Uh, those patients uh, who used the sound generator paid about one-third the amount of dollars for every one percentage point of increase in uh, their THI score. So remember we said that the THI is score between zero and 100. So zero is no perception of tinnitus whatsoever. 100 is maximal perception. So if a patient went from 35 to 34, that might have cost $600 using a sound generator. And using the neuromonics technique, it cost almost $1,800. And that's not to say that there's a problem with neuromonics, because there are times when I would really recommend it, because sometimes there are patients who have a profile that's more um, in alignment with the neuromonics procedure and protocol, and so I would go that way. Um, for some people, they respond very well to tinnitus therapy. Some people don't, as we talked about. One thing that's uh, interesting, this came out in 2014. This is Dr. Theodorov's uh, work, also peer-reviewed. He talks about if a patient complains that their tinnitus is within their head versus within their ear, uh, and if they have a self-report of hearing problems. So if tinnitus is within their head, if they perceive it as in the head rather than in the ear, they have a three times greater likelihood that we can manage their tinnitus successfully. So that's the good news. The bad news is that only happens about 10 or 15 percent of the time. 85 percent of the patients will perceive it in their ear. Interesting research. Uh, this is a um, online survey that came out in 2015 uh, by Carpenter Thompson and colleagues, and it was reported in Ear and Hearing, again peer reviewed. So 1,030 people, 630 people responded, so that's pretty good. Pretty good. Um, and they were working with the idea that if you had high level of physical activity, like you play golf, you play tennis, you swim, you jog, did that improve your quality of life and lower tinnitus severity? And it seems that it does. Physical activity, such as tennis or dancing or swimming, had a small but statistically significant correlation with quality of life and reducing tinnitus distress. So physical activity is good. Sitting around the house, not so good. Um, Conclusion. So this is, um, if you go to uh, Google and you put in hearing journal, comma, Beck, comma, June 2011, tinnitus, you'll pull up this article. So the conclusions from my 2011 article, hearing aids in tandem with counseling are beneficial for the tinnitus management up to 90% of the time. Examples of successful management of the tinnitus patient facilitated through hearing aid amplification are voluminous. I, I shared with you all those papers by Kochkin, and Rich Tyler and those folks. And, and that's what we're talking about. We, we have documentation that hearing aids are very beneficial. Advanced hearing aids, the newer hearing aids, offer alternatives previously not available, such as open fitting, so your ears are a little more comfortable, extended bandwidth, so we go up to maybe 10 or 12,000 hertz in some hearing aids, connectivity, that is you can, um, you can hook up your hearing aids to a TV, to a telephone, so it's Excuse me, so it's much easier to, to hear because you don't get the background noises prominently. If a hearing aid fitting doesn't work, good news, 100% reversible. You can take them out. And so I concluded that hearing aid amplification is the primary treatment for tinnitus. Um, so my personal recommendations, if we're going to use some sort of masker, water, rain, shower, ocean sounds are excellent. I would recommend don't, don't buy a $19.95 device um, because you want something reliable. You want something made by a manufacturer who's been making products for decades, if not hundreds of years. Uh, easy to fit, reliable product. There are tinnitus management guidelines. Uh, the American Academy of Audiology has a set, which are a little bit old. They're probably 12 or 15 years old, but they're very, very good. And you can look them up and learn about that as well. The exact protocol for how to manage your tinnitus, TBD, that means to be determined by the professional. 
because just telling me you have tinnitus doesn't tell me what I need to do for you. We have to talk. We have to share a little bit of time. I have to get to know how it's bothering you. I have to know what it sounds like. I have to know what problems it's causing, what solutions are acceptable to you, and then I can recommend something. But I can't just say, oh, I have tinnitus, so we're going to do this. Internal motivation matters a great deal. When somebody has tinnitus and they're putting in a claim, a legal claim for financial benefit, probably not going to help them much because their primary concern uh, is sometimes, uh, you know, that financial benefit. And so it's very hard to dismiss that because that's a very real issue that people deal with. Um, but if somebody is totally you know, distressed by their tinnitus and they really, really, really are open and they don't have any intervening factors, but they're open to solutions and trying things and working with a professional, pretty good chance of success. Uh, placebo does matter. And in this case, placebo would be something that acts to help you um, internally. Remember we talked about John Sorensis and his work from University of California, San Diego, and he said it's not just your ears, not just your hearing, not just any of those things, but your internal state matters. And if we can make you feel better and safer and more secure, that's going to help. Uh, and brains are plastic and they change all the time. So if you tried a very, very serious tinnitus management approach uh, a year ago and it didn't work, you might be uh, surprised to try it again and see that perhaps it would work because your brain changes over time. So those are the formal slides that I assembled and, and the timing was good. I estimated 50 minutes. It took us 47. Uh, and I have no idea how to turn on the sound, so I'm going to have to let Nancy tell me what to do here and I'll be happy to take some questions and observations. Okay. Um, it works well that people have posted questions in the um, chat box and so I'll just go ahead and, and feed you the questions as I see them. The first question is, why do some people have tinnitus okay. even after cochlear implant while others do not have it? That's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, so tell me if I got this right because there was a little noise at the beginning. So the question is, why do some people with cochlear implants have tinnitus? Right, after don't? a cochlear implant, yeah. Right. Well, nobody knows the answer to this. This is a, a fascinating question. You know, the vast majority of patients who get cochlear implants, I will tell you that their perception of tinnitus is much less and they find that when they're wearing their cochlear implant, uh, tinnitus is much more manageable. Some patients, not true at all. Um, we have some speculation, which I don't want to share with you because it, it's speculation. Um, what I would say is that the best way to handle that is you have to speak to your audiologist and say, okay, the uh, cochlear implant clearly is working fine. I'm, I'm getting auditory perceptions. Is there another program you might offer me that might work a little bit differently with my tinnitus? Because Dr. Beck said that sometimes the best program or the best map for hearing loss may not be the best map for tinnitus. So it's something you can try. I wish I had an answer. I don't know of an answer and I don't know anybody who has an answer. Um, this is a question we've been looking at now for about 35 years. Uh, cochlear implants were first FDA approved, I believe, in 86. I was at the House Ear Institute and we were the primary group in the U.S. There are a few groups, but uh, UCSF was involved, the group in Utah was involved, New York was involved, and Los Angeles, I was at the House Ear Institute when implants were FDA approved. And we noticed that exact same observation early on, that some patients had relief of tinnitus, some had partial relief, and some had no relief. And I, the work is still ongoing. I wish I could tell you, but I don't know. Um, somebody asked if you yourself have tinnitus. Um, I truly do not. I am a musician. I have a very, very little bit of high frequency loss. But I will tell you that uh, everybody has tinnitus from time to time. You, you, when you talk to your friends, your colleagues, your associates, and you say, do you ever get a ringing or a whistling sensation in your ear? The answer is almost always yes. But remember, the second part of the, of the definition is a failure to adapt. So when most people hear tinnitus, it's, it's an annoying sensation. It comes and goes. Whether it's really gone away or whether you've adapted to it is the same effect. It doesn't bother you anymore. So I don't, but I, um, I play a doctor who does. <laughs> um, if you have hearing loss in one ear and hear the tinnitus in the same ear, do you need one hearing aid or two? Excellent question. All the time when you perceive um, hearing loss or tinnitus in one ear, the very most important thing I can tell you is you need a proper workup. 
okay? Let's presume you've had that done. You've seen your doctor. You've seen an audiologist. <coughs> Excuse me. Any, so anytime you have one ear symptoms, that, that's MAMS and workup. So I'm going to presume you've done that. And if you haven't, please do. Um, the answer to that question is we always start with two. And here's why. If this ear has hearing loss and tinnitus, and I put a hearing aid in here, now I have an unusual different sound in both ears. So I've caused a relative asymmetry in your hearing and in your tinnitus perception. I would rather fit you with both, and then I can control it more, and you're going to get more of a balanced sensation. When we fit one ear hearing, there's a, there's a lot of problems that come with that. Um, number one, think about this. There are no animals born with healthy ears that have one ear. There are no people born with one ear that, that are, you know, that have a healthy auditory system. When we uh, only manage one ear, we are giving you an asymmetric um, hearing, and it's very, very discouraging in noise and in frustrating situations. So if we presume that stress is a high, uh, um, per, a high percentage of people with tinnitus are under stress, and then we give them an unusual sensation in just one ear, when they're in noise, they're not going to be able to understand speech and noise at all. So I, I always start with two. And you can read, um, if you go to hearingreview.com, in 2016 I published a paper with a colleague of mine uh, from England. His name is David Bagley. And David's among the premier authors in uh, tinnitus. Actually, it was an interview I did with him. And I asked him that question in January 2016. I said, so Dr. Bagley, if we have a patient with, one, with tinnitus in just one ear, what do you do? And he said, we fit them with two hearing aids. Okay, uh, Teresa, or Teresita um, commented that she's had sensory neural hearing loss since uh, she was born. Her um, hearing aids really do not help her tinnitus very much. She, um, still, ha she still hears the tinnitus. She does um, what she can to distract herself so that it's less. Um, and she notices that if she eats foods that are too salty, the level of tinnitus is more aggressive. Have you heard that before? Yeah, there's, um, there's some literature on salt. Um, salt certainly is annoying if you have high blood pressure and if you have cardiac issues. Some, there are some people who have said that a higher salt intake bothers their tinnitus. There are some people who have said higher salt intakes are, um, are things that can disrupt Meniere's patients, making them more dizzy and more likely to suffer Meniere symptoms, uh, such as dizziness, such as vertigo, such as tinnitus, such as hearing loss. Uh, the scientific literature on that hasn't really panned out, but we certainly know that there are people who are susceptible to salt intake. So one of the easiest things to do, and it's not going to cause anybody any harm, throw away the salt shaker. Don't buy any prepared foods that have salt in them, and you'd be surprised just about everything you eat does, much like sugar. And, it, you know, it's such an easy experiment. If the tinnitus is really bothering you and you know that you put salt on food all the time, uh, I would say number one thing to do is stop adding salt. That's very easy. It's very quick. It, it costs nothing. And you, you've got to give that about 30 days. Some people, it'll, you'll see a difference in three days, some people a week. But you know what? Try it for 30 days. And, and if, if your tinnitus is much less, don't put salt on anything. It's real simple. And now, do I think it's going to work for everybody or even most people? No, I really don't. But I do think absolutely there are some people who are susceptible to, to uh, sodium and salt levels. Now, the research will also tell you that it does, because I know as soon as I answer that question, people are going to say, oh, I use sea salt. To your body, that's exactly the same thing. You can look this up in Google. It's very important to understand all salt, no matter where it comes from, your body takes it the same way, just like sugar. When you talk about sugar versus honey versus syrup, the molecular formula for that is C6. O12, uh, C6H12O6, I think I got that right. So it's a carbohydrate, and it's the um, amount of hydrogen and oxygen and carbon in that molecule that, that your body treats as sugar. And it just doesn't matter whether it comes from syrup or from um, sugar cane. It's still sugar to your body, and salt is still salt. So you're not going to get around this by using sea salt or any other healthy salt. You may like them better, and, they, you know, and, and that's fine, but, but to your body it's the same thing. Um, is there any evidence of benefit from acupuncture? Well, so acupuncture is brilliant for pain relief. 3,000 years old, maybe older. Um, 
if you go back to my original premise that people who perceive tinnitus have a high likelihood of having stress, um, acupuncture decreases pain very effectively in some people. Not all, but, but many, many people get benefit. And there's peer-reviewed benefit from acupuncture. It absolutely works. Many people often. Uh, not everybody every time, but many people often. It depends who the acupuncturist is and all this stuff. But presuming that you've got a good, uh, knowledgeable acupuncture uh, person and, uh, and you're under stress, um, it wouldn't surprise me if some of those people also have lower back pain, cervical neck pain, or muscular pain, and things are difficult, and the acupuncture then, much like pharmacology, helps to de-stress them. So it doesn't work directly on their tinnitus, but if it helps to de-stress them and make their body more comfortable because they're in less pain, that goes a long way towards relief. Um, who would you go see about the progressive tinnitus management, uh, the PTM? Would you go see your audiologist or an ENT doctor? <coughs> Thank you. Um, it's, it's not as easy as it should be to find people who do PTM. What I would do, and, and he'll probably get upset that I said this, but I would send an email to Dr. Henry. And, I'd, and I would say, uh, dear Dr. James Henry, uh, Dr. Beck was speaking accolades about progressive tinnitus management, and I'd like to know if there's a practitioner in my area. Now, the other way you could do it is, of course, just put your zip code in Google and put in progressive tinnitus management, comma, tinnitus, and you're pretty likely, if you're in a major city, to find somebody. If you're out in the middle of nowhere, it's going to be tough. Maybe we can get Dr. Henry to come present in Salt Lake City. Well, maybe. I, I have no idea what his schedule is, but perhaps. <laughs> um, okay. Um, let's see. Lenny has said, I'm almost certain I got tinnitus from salicylates. Salicy 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 yeah, that's aspirin. I'm sure if I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, that means aspirin. Which is in almost everything. Has anyone tried to lower their intake to lower tinnitus? Right. Well, salicylates just means aspirin. Your aspirin is a salicylate. And uh, it absolutely has been linked, uh, without any doubt, when you take high levels of aspirin, you're likely to get tinnitus. Uh, and the number one cure for that is to discontinue or reduce the salicylates. Now, don't do that on your own. Uh, I presume if you take enough aspirin that it's causing tinnitus that your doctor put you on it. And you need to mention that to your doctor because he or she might then say, oh, well, we have many other things we can do. We can put you on ibuprofen, or we can put you on acetaminophen, or we can put you on some other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, pain relieving drug. But that's not, you know, if you're on that drug because your doctor puts you on, do not get off that drug unless you talk to your doctor because the, he or she may have put you on it for other reasons and, and there may be substitutes available, but I, I would never tell you to discontinue it without speaking to your physician. Um, Carol said, what about people who are totally deaf? I'm assuming she's asking about the incidence of tinnitus in people that are deaf. Yeah, and, and it is a sensation that uh, deaf people report. So if you're totally deaf, meaning absolutely no perception of sound, um, because there are deaf patients, of course, who wear hearing aids. There are deaf patients who wear cochlear implants. But if this is a deaf person who doesn't do either, probably the single most important thing is going to be cognitive behavioral therapy. And the question comes up, how do you find somebody who does that? So let me give you a hint on that. Um, many pain relief clinics across America, if you put in pain relief doctor, pain relief clinic, it's oftentimes an anesthesiologist who runs those clinics. And he or she probably has psychologists and or psychiatrists they work with. And if you say, I have tinnitus, I'm looking for a practitioner who does cognitive behavioral therapy. Can you recommend anybody? They probably can, because you know, um, oftentimes if you're at a, if your pain is severe enough to go to a pain clinic, there, there's more to managing it than pharmaceuticals. Sometimes it's physical therapy. Sometimes it's um, massage therapy. Sometimes it's chiropractic. Sometimes it's cognitive behavioral therapy. Sometimes it's other types of counseling. Uh, several people have asked about the role of TMJ with tinnitus. Yeah, this was a, TMJ was a big deal about 20 and 30 years ago. Um, I, I think there's a likelihood that people who 
suffer from uh, temporal mandibular joint syndrome probably perceive tinnitus. Uh, TMJ hurts. Sometimes it makes noise. It adds to your stress. Um, I think with TMJ, uh, certainly I'd try hearing aids, but I think the likelihood is uh, work with a good dentist, see if we can relieve the signs and symptoms of TMJ, and, and I presume whoever asked that question has, has taken that route. Uh, after that, if there is hearing loss, I would certainly try hearing aids. Uh, even if there isn't hearing loss, I might try hearing aids, depending on how the tinnitus handicap inventory looks. If the score is very high, I'd be likely to do something. Uh, and, and again, failing that, I'd go with cognitive behavioral therapy, because if you have a patient who has TMJ and is very distressing, very annoying, very distracting in their life, no hearing loss, uh, and, and they don't want to be bothered going into hearing aids, okay, uh, so let's move on to cognitive behavioral therapy and see if we can offer some relief there. Okay, um, one last uh, quick question since we're uh, right at 9 o'clock. Have you had any experience with the Desyncra Coordinated Reset Neuromodulation Device? If so, what's your opinion? Well, um, in the tinnitus literature, there are many, many devices that come out all the time. I can't say anything about this one. I'm not familiar with it. Whoever develops a new tinnitus device or protocol, you know, has usually pilot studied it on somebody, and, you know, they're going to publish that it did well on that pilot study or in that, that period, or they're not going to push the device further. So I don't know who these authors are, and I don't know the device, but here's what I would tell you. If there was a cure that worked on everybody all the time, your audiologist and your doctor would know about it. If there was a miraculous new device, your audiologist and your doctor would know about it. If there were an easy way to manage this, your doctor and your audiologist would know about this. Um, I don't doubt that whoever has put forward this device has some good, interesting data, and I'm certainly not going to say anything negative about it because I haven't read it. And I'm not going to say anything positive about it because I've never seen one that did better than the others. But I would say this. If you see that the device has been peer-reviewed in a scientific journal and has done well, then you should investigate it. I would be very cautious about seeking too much information based on what could be marketing claims. And that doesn't mean that the marketing claims are false. But it means until a scientific uh, process has been undertaken, meaning you have people who are experimental group and a control group, that's the scientific method. And without that, we really don't know what's going on. We have to have those trials that tell us we treated these people this way, these people this way, this changed it, this didn't. So when we have that kind of data uh, from an independent source, then we can believe it scientifically. Again, I'm not going to say they're bad or good or anything else because I'm not familiar with it, but I can tell you that at least two or three times a year a new device comes out and they always have fantastic claims. And when they're looked at scientifically through the peer-reviewed literature, they, they tend to fall away. So I, I think um, it's good for you to be aware of them, and it's good to investigate it. But I wouldn't spend a lot of money until I have some peer-reviewed data showing that this stuff works. Good advice. Um, just wanted to mention that um, for HLA 2017 convention in Salt Lake City, we have a whole track on tinnitus and noise. So. Um, I know that it's just one of those things, besides how to afford hearing aids, it's the question that we get mo most often, what do I do about the ringing in my ears? So I know it's a, it's a problem and um, any workshops that we have I know will be very popular with a lot of our attendees. Um, thank you, Dr. Beck, very much. Um, I hope that you'll consider presenting again. And for you in the audience, if you enjoyed this webinar, please uh, consider joining HLAA if you're not a member already. And you'll um, be sure to get Dr. Beck's article in the January, February issue of Hearing Loss Magazine. Thank you again to Cindy Thompson for providing excellent carts this evening. And thank you all for attending tonight. Thanks again, Dr. Beck. My pleasure. Take care. Thanks for inviting me. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye.